Welcome to From Potential to Powerhouse, success secrets from female leaders, where female trailblazers share their journeys and the aha moments that made all the difference with your host, serial entrepreneur and trailblazer herself, Tracy Holland. Desiree has had an incredible life and career, not only time in the White House, but she has also run publicly traded companies. She ran the Illinois Lottery. She's a graduate of Harvard with a business degree and was formerly married to John Rogers, who is one of the most powerful men in investing in the country and owns, I think, the largest minority-owned investment banking company in the United States, Aries Capital. And she's also a mother, which we'll talk a little bit about, and a cancer survivor. So we have a lot to cover today. Welcome, Desiree. I'm so excited to have you. Well, hey, thank you. Can't wait to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So Desiree, I've had such an an enjoyed reading about your career path I think we should talk for a quick second before we jump into your story, how you and I connected, which is from your most incredible powerhouse daughter, <laughs> Victoria, who approached me three years ago and asked if I would be willing to sit down and do an informational interview with her. And I thought, sure, of course. And I met her through someone that I know, respect and like, which is how most people get hired or, yes. you know, yeah. Like is important. (laughs) Yes. And so because she was recommended to me by someone that I trust, I I said, of course, I'll make time for you. And so she came and sat in my office and you know what we're like busy schedules packed. Someone comes in and says, oh, Victoria is here to do her informational interview. And I thought, (laughs) I don't know if I've ever done one of these before. (laughs) So I brought her into my office. I sat down. I had anticipated a a sharp 45 minutes because that's all I had budgeted for our time for that day. And I literally was blown away by your daughter. I was enamored how articulate, how thoughtful, how strategic, how poised, how intelligent. And she truly came for an informational interview, not with the intention of being hired. She wanted advice. And I couldn't believe that this young woman had said to me, I've spent the last six months sitting down with people I respect, asking questions about how they built their career, how they became successful. And so I'm just gathering data. And I was floored on the (laughs) ground. I thought, can I get her to my house for dinner? Can I have her spend time with my kids? So I, I, first of all, you know, want to let everyone listening know that I was so fortunate to get to know you through your incredible daughter, so congratulations on whatever you did there. Also well, raising thank you. a powerhouse. Thank you, thank you so much for those accolades for Victoria. I, I so appreciate it. She's a, she's a good one. Everyone should watch for her because her career is going to be as epic, if not more so than her parents, which is actually, frankly, hard to imagine. <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. <laughs> you did really. We so, hope that she's happy and is enjoying the work she's doing. Yeah, she is incredible. And I hope she's listening and um, knows how much I respect her and the work that's in the path that she's on. So Desiree, we're going to jump in. So let's just highlight, you know, secretary, uh, social secretary to the Obama administration, uh, public company running uh, executive, um, the lottery in Chicago, building a couple billion dollar business there and making it hip and cool, uh, running a big publishing company that we're going to talk about, and now being an entrepreneur, where you've pivoted into entrepreneurship by the purchase and ownership of Black Opal. Yes. And Fashion Fair. Also own Fashion Fair. Yes. And we're going to talk about both of those brands and what it means to be an entrepreneur, because you've had such an incredible career. Um. But one of the things I would love to find out a little bit more about is who you were as a youngster, as a young woman. Were you a rebel or were you a rule follower? What was your life like? 
Well, I have to say, first of all, I uh, thank you for this interview. I'm looking forward to our conversation and can't wait to like share. So the first thing I would say is definitely a rebel. Um, I come from New Orleans and New Orleans is known for its revelry, but also it's not following the rules. And so I definitely was not necessarily a rule follower, although I had lots of rules in front of me. I was, went to Catholic school and, you know, in the Catholic school, there's lots of rules. And so I, I think I tried to follow them as best I could, but still, even as a young person, being true to myself. And so I can remember a time where my father was called down to school because I wasn't doing so well in the religion class. And I was asking, I think, too many questions that, you know, if you study religion at all, you know, a lot of it is it, our stories. And I wanted those to be factual. I'm like, that's impossible. How does that work? You know, so I think not really a rule follower, I would say. Always so, like very curious. So were you questioning what you were learning in Catholic school about sin and who's good, who's bad? What, what I that was. I had been such a good, you know, little student from kindergarten, or I would say from first grade to eighth grade. And I got to ninth grade and I'm like, I don't know if this makes so much sense to me anymore. And so I was asking a lot of questions and I don't think the nuns like that so much. So how did you know? dad handle that? He went down there and he came back. I don't know what the conversation was. He came back. He goes, you got to do a little bit better in this religion class, Desiree. You know, because I don't know. I, I don't know why I was getting a C or something. I was getting a bad, a bad grade for him because he always wanted. My father's also a coach. So he's like, come on, you got to do better than this, kiddo. And so I said, I just don't believe this anymore. I'm just struggling with this. He said, well, right. let's just do the best we can. Let's be polite. We don't have to ask 10 questions every class. And I got through it. I so made were, friends with the nuns. <laughs> and were your parents Catholic? My father was Catholic and my mother became Catholic to marry my father. She's now back Baptist. Okay. So that was another, you know, in, oh, internal bet. to the home. You know, he thought if I, if I went to Catholic mass, that was mass. If I went to Baptist, that was not mass. I still had to go to Catholic mass. So did, did, were your parents, do you remember a happy home for the most part? For the most part, very different people, but, um, you know, same values, you know, same values, certainly in terms of raising my brother. And I have one brother who's an engineer. So certainly, you know, very much the same values. Education was important. Community service was important. Being thankful, you know, being kind, being ambitious, I would say. Those were all shared values in, in the home. The way they each did it may have been a little bit different. And do you, are you the the oldest in the I birth am. order? Two years, two Are years, you, we're two years apart. Do you think there's something to this oldest birth order uh, I, bossiness I, I, side well, of us? I, I do. And I think my dad like kind of encouraged that, you know, in a, in a way, because he, he really didn't treat me, you know, as a, I mean, he was respectful as a young girl, but he just didn't believe in that. He thought like girls can do anything boys can do. You know, he would have my brother and I wrestling to a certain age when he figured out like, okay, she's no longer going to beat him. We'll, we'll stop that. But right. he liked the fact that I was beating my brother in wrestling up into a certain point. He thought that was like encouraging for me. I had no idea. I was like, boy, I'm really strong here. He's like, yeah, you are. And then he was like, no more wrestling. I'm like, why? Because he knew I would lose. <laughs> yeah. And as a coach. <laughs> right. Was he, it sounds like he's probably pretty competitive. So on some oh, level, it sounds like he's trying to teach you to be a little competitive. Super competitive. You got a win, win, win girl. Yeah. I like <laughs> we don't that. quit. The Glapions, that's my maiden name. We're warriors. Ooh, that's a good name. I <laughs> we love are that. warriors. <laughs> yes. And so you're, from your perspective, growing up, did you feel the world is my oyster or living in New Orleans? Were you really fe facing like, this is going to be a difficult path for me? And where, where do I need to, how, what was your perspective in terms of leaning into all the possibilities? Sure. My perspective was, you know, most New Orleanians, they don't leave. It's such a wonderful, magical place that many people, it can be very insular. And so generations and generations of people make their homes there and continue to make their homes there. I think at a very young age, I, I made a decision that I was not going to make my home there, that I was going to go off to school. I chose the East Coast um, and that we would see where life would take me. So I'm talking about like six years old. 
I'm talking about very early on, I, I made a decision that I'm not staying here. I'm not, I want to experience different things, different foods. You know, I was like a staunch like potato and, and steak girl at an early age, as opposed to all the seafood that's down there. I was like, I want this. I want that. And my father was like, oh, okay. All right. And so I did know pretty early on that I was going to be leaving. Interesting. So and what, would you say you were closer to your father growing up or to your mom or equally? I would say probably my mom, although I would say, you know, very compartmentalized. So this one for these things, this one for these things. And I still have that cadre of support and friends that offer advice in many different areas. So I think one of the ways that I think about self-reflection and just, and how I kind of keep going is I've got different people that counsel me on very different things, you know, and I think everyone has a skill set and uh, in, insights to certain things. And so I have a whole group of people in the closet that help me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't oh, we all? Group. I just opened that door. I'm like, okay, I need you today. <laughs> Don't we all? My gosh, it's so important. So you went to Wellesley, Wellesley yes, mm -hmm. in undergrad. Yes. What was that like? You know, shocking. I, I, I had cousins that had gone away to school in the, on the East Coast and two older cousins, and they kind of made the decision for me. I, I thought I was probably going to go to, to school in Washington, D.C. because I had been there a number of times, but they said, nope, 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 nope. Don't apply to those. You're going to go to Wellesley. This is going to be the best place for you. And you're going to go to grad school at Harvard. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. I'm wide. And I went to, off to Wellesley. The first time seeing it is when I arrived on campus for, um, for school and immediately started to notice a lot of differences. I mean, from the, from the South, I mean, exposure to women from all over the country and all over the world, mm. um, a real eclectic collection of um, uh, styles, even in terms of food, and what was offered, how people dressed, what their um, insights, I would say insights, but beliefs were, you know, so it was just like a sponge, mm -hmm. overload on sponge. And also and, I could have a lot of fun too. So I had a well, lot of fun my freshman year. That's good. <laughs> that's always important. So were you a naturally good student? Were you, or did you have to work hard in school? I to think, perform? you know, I had some good preparation um, at my high school. But certainly not, I, I would say it wasn't the best school in the world that I came from. I came from a good, good all girls Catholic school, probably one of the best ones in New Orleans, but still very different. And so I had to play some catch up. I think the thing that was remarkable for me in my freshman year was I was juggling my father's wish for me to be a physician with that course load. But more importantly, and I had no interest in that, which I quickly found out, to um, to juggling um, just some failure in that first year. And that failure was in the language department. I'd always had a problem with languages. And so even in high school, I struggled with language and wound up moving from French to Latin where I could memorize. Mm -hmm. And it was an unspoken language. And so I was tested in my freshman year. And unbeknownst to me, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. And so and you say, oh, that's terrible. I was like, hooray, no language for me. Hooray, no right. language for me. Because it was just killing me. I just couldn't get the language. And so um, it was enlightening to me in many ways because it explained how I'd learned for the past 17 years, You know how I took in information, why I was not able to perhaps pronounce persons, people's names the correct way. Um, my spelling was, I could spell anything that I saw, but that I really couldn't sound things out. That was just missing from my learning. And so, and I also had an amazing memory. Wow. Lots of data. You know, what's amazing to me though, it shows your tenacity because for the first 17 years of your life in school, not diagnosed and overcoming that and getting great grades and, and having dyslexia, I mean, it, it shows that you, you're recognizing where you need to pivot and how you need to block and tackle right. to overcome. Remember that father, though, you're a warrior, get it. You know, he's not listening. It's like, dad, maybe I just can't get these languages. Just get it. <laughs> Come yeah. on now. Get right. it. I'm like, okay. 
you know, so that was that was a really good thing because I and I do have a certain amount of spirit and I did go through a period where, you know, I had these, you know, failures in those classes, but not until college did someone say, hey, this doesn't match up with these other grades. Maybe there's something else here, you know, that's blocking this person from that. So it, it made me aware pretty early on that, you know what, you got to like different people learn different ways. Right. And that's not a bad thing. It's not and a how thing. did at that time, how were you feeling about your femininity? I mean, were you more of a tomboy? definitely a feminist from were day you? one? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, that was part of my other rationale for leaving the South at that time. I was like, I'm not uh, going to go to LSU to find my husband. I am not going to, I refuse to be a debutante. In New Orleans, there's a lot of like these cotillions and debutantes. I had been selected by our state senator to be in the cotillion at the White House for Mardi Gras. I said no to all of that. I did none of that. None of those ball things. I'm like, ah, dad, no, <laughs> sorry, pal. <laughs> Not going to do that. And so I think, you know, very early on a, a feminist and I had, you know, my grandmother and my mother who were entrepreneurs and were running their own businesses that I saw, you know, from the time I could even think about anything. And so it never occurred to me to be dependent upon a spouse or a husband or anything like that, or that women couldn't do, be, have anything that they wanted to have because the women in my family were, you know, doing it and getting it done. <laughs> right. And do you remember a time in your twenties and I think about your daughter. So it's just, I can only imagine you were a similar, uh, similar in profile was there something in your twenties in terms of getting you into your career on your career path? That was a big pivot moment or did you, did you kind of fall into that first stage? No, of your I think, I think the biggest pivot really was when coming out of graduate school, I wound up going to Harvard business school, coming out of graduate school, I made a decision not to go into investment banking or management consulting. And I made a decision that I really wanted to be in management. And I really wanted to be in line management. And so I wanted to manage people building or providing a service or, you know, I ultimately one day wanted have to have responsibility for a large leadership position of a wide scope of people. And so at that time, it was very unusual for someone lead in my class to go into whether manufacturing or telecom or something like that, yeah. most uh, stayed in the, you know, in the more, I would call them white shoe mm -hmm. uh, uh, professions. Right. You know, and they kept saying, ah, oh, you're not going to, you're not going to make any money. You're going to, I said, you know what, one day you guys will be calling me to run those companies you bought. Watch. Yes. Right. Watch. I said, I want to run a company. I don't want to be a consultant. And how did, why, why do you think you knew that at that time? Well, one of my like models as a young kid was I wanted to run something. <laughs> he said, well, what do you want to do? I want to be in charge. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just want to be in charge of what? I don't know something. <laughs> right. I just want I to understand. be in charge of something. Yeah, I understand. You I know? think you and I found through our CI testing. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty... so funny. Your friend that runs their CI testing, he said, you are like, want to not work. You want to work for yourself. But I That's did right. a lot of jobs where I worked for other people. But they gave so, me the room and space to do that. And so was AT&T your first corporate gig? Did you move into a role of management there? Yeah. In between college and business school, I had applied to AT&T because they were offering this kind of job to people coming out of college, which is hard to find, you know, a job where they were going to give you a line group, you know, group of people to manage. Yeah. And so I um, was lucky enough to um, be called by New England Telephone to take a job in between uh, business school. And so after business school, they, you know, I interviewed with them and they said, of course, well, we would love to have you back and offer you, you know, this line position, you know, in Chicago, uh, New York and headquarters, at and headquarters was going to give me a desk job. Of course, you know, I didn't want that. So I, that's how I ended up in Chicago with my line position in wow. uh, operations. Yes. <laughs> and, and so, and so you left, did you leave that role and move into the state Illinois state lottery uh, role or was there something in between 
There was something in between. I, you know, AT&T, they moved me along. I got to go back to headquarters, you know, after a certain, this is just the overall training to move up in the senior ranks at a company that size. You got to do a stint in headquarters. And so I actually did move back to headquarters for like two weeks. And so I was like, this is not for me. And uh, actually my ex-husband, he said, oh, what would you like to do? Because he was in Chicago. I was now in, outside of New York. What would you like to do? I told him, oh, I, I met this guy who I thought was amazing. Maybe I could work for him. Unbeknownst to me, he called the guy, got me an interview, and I wound up working for that guy. So I worked for an entrepreneur here in Chicago that was doing retail. He was opening um, newsstands in large office buildings, you know, the mm-hmm. newsstand with the mm-hmm. papers and the candy and sure. all that. And so I did, I opened about 36 of those with that guy back in Chicago before we had Victoria. Wow. So you got a chance to, whoa. Uh, you got a chance to um, run retail. Yes, I did. So that was my first entree into retail. You know, how is the buying done? Looking at uh, consumption patterns, looking at the differences from newsstand to newsstand. The mercantile exchange, those guys chewed a lot of gum and ate a lot of candy. <laughs> <laughs> the Sears Tower sold a lot of plush, a lot of little dolls and bears, et cetera, with Chicago on them. So it, it allowed me, you know, to, to see how that business worked, to really like see what would motivate people working in that kind of environment, put an incentive program in place. So it was a very basic thing, but at the same time, it was 36 stores. And then we um, moved on to uh, New York and some other cities. So I actually was in on the design of the, of the space and how that works. So I did learn a lot in that um, job. And then um, we, um, we bought another much larger newsstand company at that time. I exited because I was about to have Victoria. So, and so talk to me, what time of, what, how old were you around this time? Uh, 29. Okay. And did you meet your husband in grad school? No, I met him after I moved to Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And, and your husband, uh, your ex-husband now, but your husband at the time was, what was his, was he an investment banker at that he, time? Or no, no, he, he's an entrepreneur. He started his own company at 23. Wow. Aerial Investments. It's still going. Yes. It's the largest minority owned money management firm in the country. Yeah. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's a big one. He's a pretty impressive guy. <laughs> he is. He's really smart. It's really funny because <laughs> when Victoria told me all about you, I said, wow. I said, so what's your dad like? And then she told me, and I thought, holy smokes, this young woman is really has two of the most incredibly powerhouse parents, really, of <laughs> anyone I think I may know. <laughs> Oh my I can gosh. think of a few more, but anyway. I can, I can hand, I, I can think of a handful, but it would be fun to have a dinner party with all of you. <laughs> yes. No. So he was, he had his own business. Okay. Yeah. And still is, you know, has his own business. Okay. And so do you, did you decide to have children at that point or was Victoria a surprise? No, she wasn't a surprise. We, we wanted to have Victoria. Ooh, beautiful. <laughs> so you were working and pregnant. Yes. And so did- I exited that that job as they were um, purchasing another company. So it was perfect timing. Perfect. And then I did a tiny little consulting business for in retail for museum retail for mm-hmm. just a very short period of time. And then I got the call about the lottery position. Mm-hmm. And so John, who is always has kind of a far ahead of both of us in terms, he's really good at kind of understanding skill set and then recommending you for something or matching you up to a position or job or career that you might be good at. And so he was the one that said, you know, I think you maybe could be good at this lot. It's retail, it's marketing, it's all the stuff you like. I mean, why wouldn't you try to go for this job? And I being the young, however old I was, I go, I'm not going to sell lottery tickets to people that can't afford them. This is terrible. I'm, I don't want to do, you know, and then I did my research and all of this stuff. And um, I actually was called in for the interview by the governor elect because it's a statewide position. 
it's it, not it's Chicago. A, is it's it a state. state? Is it a it's state? It's important to the governor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it is, is it a revenue generating? It's like a, it's a revenue generating yeah, resource. Yeah, $2 billion. Right. right. Yes. For, for the state For the state itself. of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And what is the, what do the funds go to? Education. Like, I'm just curious. Education in, in, in this state, education. That makes sense. And so I was able to, um, you know, at 30, be part, like I'm the youngest member in the, in the governor's cabinet. Wow. So that and, was a lot of fun. And who, and who was the governor at that time? James, uh, Jim Edgar. Okay. And so were you, is it, were you a Democrat or a Republican? I was independent at that time. He is a moderate Republican. Okay. So I guess, you know, when you think about the, I, this is new to me. So the state lottery, even I appreciated getting to know that about you because I've never a met someone who's run a lottery before <laughs> and B I didn't know what, I really didn't understand the mechanism for what it was. I knew it was revenue generating for, for yeah, uh, the state. It's really the only business inside of a state government. If you think about it, that in tourism, I've done that too, but we can talk about that later, but those are big money generators um, in terms of, you know, what they are able to do for a city and a state. And so, you know, you are, you've got a business, you have retailers, again, had retailers, started telemarketing there, did lots of advertising. We had 60 million in advertising dollars to spend each year. I had 300 employees across the state. Um, it was great. For 30 years old, I was really enjoying it, really learned a lot and really honed in on this um, importance of building uh, teams across people that I would say have been in those jobs for a very long time mm -hmm. and new people mm -hmm. and making certain that each team and each group is respectful of the others, other, but there's so much to learn from people that have been there a while. And there's also a lot to learn from people that haven't been there for a while. So mm -hmm. also always looking for clues about how we could do things better based on factual and experience information from people that have been there. And, you know, I, I have to assume, and we can fast forward for just a sec, was this experience, and I know we never know this as we're in the moment, it, it only ties together right in hindsight when we're maybe five or 10 years down the road and we think, oh my gosh, that was a pivot moment and I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. Did your role in running the Illinois State Lottery give you access to what was going to be your role in the White House? Did you get a chance to meet? And because of the political nature or being involved in a, a state in uh, a state group like that give you access or was that independent? It came later. It came in the next job. But I think that it gave me access to the world of business across the state mm -hmm. and the world of politics within the state and the city. Mm -hmm. And so I am... I, because I traveled all over the state, I just met so many people. I met all the legislative body and executive branch that were running the state. And remember, everybody that's in government doesn't stay in government. So those people scattered all over the country, mm -hmm. you know, and also John and I were very involved in, at the time, uh, Canada Daily, who became the mayor here for 30 years. And so you know, it was a, a time where there was just a lot happening, both in his career and in the work that I was doing. And were you able to balance being mom and running this agency and building this billion, multi-billion dollar business? I don't know how well I was able to manage. I mean, I was very focused on, you know, being that winner at work for sure. Mm -hmm. I would say that, um, you know, Victoria would have to answer. She just was interviewed and she goes, both of my parents were working. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, doing art and drawing and that kind of thing, which uh, I think is, 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 is kind of funny. But I, I think we, I did the best I could. I would say that, you know, Victoria's like, you didn't bake the muffins. I'd be like, but look, we got every flavor that we bought. <laughs> and <laughs> I just and, have one, you know? Yeah. And we had great, great, you know, great help at home for sure. Um, but I think, you know, I was gone a lot. Both of us were gone a lot. Yeah. We were working really hard in, 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 in those years um, because it just was, I don't know that it was, it was normal for our family. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, I totally understand. And, you know, I think 
there's never going to be a hindsight that says, oh, you made Thanksgiving dinner versus had someone make it for you and bring it in and you still had a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner, Mm -hmm. right? Luckily, my mother still always does Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, you're so lucky. So we always have Thanksgiving in New Orleans. Oh, <laughs> so that so... one I got a check mark. I yeah. got double yes. check marks on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you went at some point and worked actually, which is so cool. It makes so much sense looking at your overall success. But then you went and worked in the in power. Isn't that right? Right. Again, another John move, right? Oh. So wow. the whole idea is you know, that I was in this mature business, horse racing was coming in in the state. And Mm. how were they going to make it fresh and new for and have it continue because it had stagnated. So Mm. how are we going to get additional revenues from the state lottery? And so that was really the role I was playing is how do we create additional revenues? And we wound up doing what people call scratch off games. We wound up doing, you know, doubling that business from 300 million to 600 million. Wow. creating all these partnerships and promotions and, you know, the Caesar's palace ticket and the mother's day ticket and, you know, win a $5,000 a year for life and, you know, all of these kind of fun things. And so that business was really our growth engine and it became kind of part of people's everyday life. Right. Oh, sure. I'll take a dollar ticket, you know, Oh, it's fun. That kind of thing. Anyway. So he was the one that, because he's studying companies and strategy all the time, he was like, you know, you're really good at that. You need to go into an industry where they don't quite know that they need that yet, but you could bring that, that vision, that oomph, whatever you want to call it, that marketing, that consumerism to that industry and, you know, maybe be, you know, a star. (laughs) So I said, okay. I said, I don't know if I like power, but let's try it. Yep. And I went, I interviewed and I did, I got a job in um, what was called people's uh, people's energy. And they own the two big gas utilities here in Chicago and the North shore. And my initial job, I mean, God knows, I didn't even know what I was doing. An initial job was in what they called like public affairs. Well, I hated that name. And I was like, I don't want to be public affairs. That's awful. How about corporate communications? Yeah. And they said, sure because that's really what it was. And so I started in the corporate communications area and you know, why it makes some sense is because there was diversification of where people could buy their power, you know, buy their gas, sure. their choices. Sure. You didn't have choice in your, you know, distributor, you know, who was literally delivering the gas to you, but uh, um, what do you call it? People that um, you, people, you wanted to have like, be able to have some rate increase over time. And so you needed to make certain that your customer service was working well and people felt like they were getting good service from you, which they didn't feel. And we were in constant battle with the city. Mm. So my political, you know, my political work in the state allowed me to over time, see how important it was to have government be you know, with us and understand what we were doing to provide service to this area just happened to be gas. And um, it also allowed me to work in a way to improve that service for people that couldn't afford their gas. So we had the highest number of people registering for additional funding um, to be able to pay their gas bills. And I got ministers involved, Reverend Jackson was involved a number of other big name ministers and um, right, uh, civil rights activists were involved in helping that happen, happen, including then state Senator Barack Obama. Wow. <laughs> and so he was very interested in people being able to, to have um, their gas and not have it turned off in the winter. Of and course. so all of that work, you know, I worked there for, about six years before I came president of those two utilities. Wow. Again, work, 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 right place, importance of consumers and public relations important to be able to position the company well and be able to talk to both sides of the the fence. Um, I'm very good friends now with a guy that used to fight me all the time, which was the citizens utility board. Why are your rates so high Rogers? You know, we're now very good friends and we laugh about, about that time, but just creating allies in a circumstance where we wouldn't normally have those allies. 
yeah. and really put your heart into your business. I mean, I was out there knocking on doors and trying to sign people up to get assistance as well. Um, and then also, you know, negotiating several union contracts um, to make certain that those employees, you know, felt good about the work they were doing. So it was, I mean, amazing um, work and experience that I had during that period of time. And I was the first female, certainly the first person without an engineering or law degree to be president of the company. That's, it's incredible. And was John's career taking off at this time as well? Oh, he had already, honey, he was like, we used to, we used to fight about who was going to get to 2 billion first when I was at the lottery. Oh, you're kidding. He beat me. He's now at, I think, 19 billion, but I, we were both like racing to get to 2 billion. That was our big, you know, thing when I was at the lottery. He's like, I'm going to get to 2 billion before you do. I'm like, okay, come on, let's see. Let's see. I mean, Desiree, it's seriously like mind boggling to me. Isn't that but fun though? It's so fun. fun. <laughs> I love it. It's so fun. Um, and so, and then you pivoted to another, I would say pretty large company. Is that right? And was that all state after that? Yeah. So um, our company sold. And so uh, we sold our company. I stayed on for transition, which is another opportunity to just see how another company worked and how big companies transition in combinations, which has been very helpful in my board work. Sure. Is just to see how that transpired and how that worked. And so we put an electric company and a gas company together over across a couple of states. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, now what? And so again, another kind of John discussion is like, ah, well, what is another kind of mature business that might need some more thinking about consumers and, you know, putting at the time, um, Tom Wilson, who still runs Allstate, had, uh, was thinking through you know, life insurance and putting all these things together. Life insurance. Now everybody's like, what's the big deal? Life insurance, home insurance, boat insurance, motorcycle, auto insurance all together. And transitioning, or at least thinking about how do you create e-commerce in that world, you know, in a place like Allstate, where the bulk of their business was done through agents, all your agents on those very corners, you know, how do we now create, you know, a platform for e-commerce? And he wound up buying insurance. Mm. So I was only there for eight months, loved working with Tom and that team, huge company, of course, and just like getting my head around everything and thinking through everything. And Again, only eight months in, and then I got a call that I was like, oh, oh, I don't think I can say no. I have to do my public service. Ooh, I want to so, hear who the call no, was from. No, I'm going to go to, to Washington, Mr. Wilson. So sorry. <laughs> oh, my God, Desiree. So but I also, it was so nice to me. They threw me a party and everything. I'd only been there eight months. They threw this big lunch. They were so proud and happy. Of All course they blue. did. All stay blue. <laughs> of course they did. They they were so lucky to have you for that even that brief period. So I cannot wait to hear what your thoughts are because you have worked for these incredibly large organizations, big resources. Now that you're you've pivoted to become an entrepreneur, I can't wait to co compare what your thoughts are. But we have to dig into taking taking that stop at the White House and what was that like for you? Wow. Well, so different. Okay. So different uh, in that, you know, who do you know that's worked in the White House? <laughs> Not a lot of people you can, you know, ask about the experience and every administration is so different. And so I think at that time, if you go back to what was it? Oh, nine, there was so, I mean, so much excitement, so much hope, so much, you know, just, rallying around this new president and first lady that oh you my just, God. Where especially were, I'll if you're from Chicago, you're like, oh my yeah. God, who's going, who's staying? I can't we're believe We're all going to be going to Chicago. I mean, to Washington. Where were just, you the day that he was on stage accepting his win? Do you remember? I was I there. Was, were you on stage? I you wasn't there? on stage. I was right in front. Oh, I, I mean, I just remember crying and crying and crying, just goose skin. And, you know, I mean, it was just such a huge moment for us in this right. country. It was just, you know, you was just caught. It was just like amazing. So you had to like 
just catch up fast to, you know, what was happening around you, what your role was as everyone was true. There's no like, here's your job description. That doesn't exist. There's no like, here are the rules of the game for any of these jobs. The best you can do is talk to people that had those jobs before you to kind of get some insight. And so I ran over, ran over to meet with Tish Baldridge. Tish Baldridge was the social secretary for Jacqueline Kennedy. Sure. And I just felt like as I looked at all of the first um, uh, social secretaries, she was the one that I felt was closest to maybe what we were going to be, you know, and why? Because she was bold. She was, you know, she did things that were innovative. She looked at the role differently. You know, it was just all this stuff. So I had great, great admiration. She passed away, but great admiration for her and Mm. how she served um, the White House. And so she was kind of my mentor. And so I got there and I, I got to work and I, I really thought based on my background that this role was really a role that it was an extension of the brand, oh, an extension okay. of what the Obamas promised for America, an extension percent. of inclusiveness and an extension of saluting and really um, of a, creating a stage for all arts and culture that's American and exposing mm. all of us to that. And so mm. everything we did, we wrote a marketing plan, a marketing document, a strategy document. And that document works something like this. The typical things you would expect our office to do, we put almost on remote control. Flowers, linens, all of that stuff. We had you know fall 10 looks, spring 10 looks. So that that became a really easy part so that we could spend our time on curating what the performances were going to be, what the goal of each program was going to be, and then most importantly, how we would um, select and integrate that audience so that not only would they see the performance and meet the first lady and the president, but they would also get something out of who they were sitting next to and who who that room comprised. Oh my God. Did and you so have to it decide? Became, that was the strategy around each, each piece, you know, and I got a lot of grief for that because people just that were in the roles before me couldn't understand. They thought that I was, was like kind of winking like, Oh, what you did wasn't a big deal. But really what I was trying to say is, Hey guys, I could never do what I'm doing had not, I understood what you guys were doing it before. And this is how I think I can bring my best work to this position along with my team. So I had two deputies, both men, one that was public policy for Mrs. Obama and the other that came from advertising and worked with me at the lottery. Oh my gosh. And so I, together we like, we, we did, I'm very proud of that body of work. And I know that it lived on after I exited um, in mm-hmm. terms of the, kind of the strategy and the documents that we put in place and how we thought about that role and what it could be. So did Victoria get to hang out with you at the White House often? She did. She she did. Yeah. Incredible. But you know, it was her first year of college. So there wasn't a lot of hanging out, you know, for her. She came, she came for a few things. So she definitely did. And did, did, were you, was this a 24 seven job? I can only imagine. Yes, absolutely. Is there any time to to sleep? I bet. I get to eat. I that bet. was kind of the good news. I mean, I was the skinniest I've ever been. <laughs> I bet. You know, and- you forget to eat or you're so tired you don't, you don't eat. And there's a lot of activity, a lot of walking, a lot mm. of wa- walking and running around. It's not really a, a desk job. No, and it's so not. you are moving around quite a bit, which was great. And then, you know, the other thing is you just, you know, you, it's such a whirlwind that I, my, my great memory got permanently damaged because it was just too much to take in so fast. It's just all the people you're meeting, you know, it was just, it was a great like crossword puzzle times 10, you know, a crossword puzzle, six dimensional crossword puzzle or six dimensional chess game is what I call it. I mean, I think the, the white house in Washington is like the super bowl. You're getting no breaks. There's the teams are the R's and the D's. There's some D's on the R team, some R's on the, on the D team that I didn't expect, 
yeah. and it, it and the press is the audience. So Ooh. go go after it. Well, and then you have to worry about who gets mad because they're sitting next to someone. Everybody gets mad, honey. Every day oh somebody's going to get God. mad about something. It sounds kind of like a nightmare in it some is ways. A, it's, it's complicated. Right. You know, and it, it's, com- I mean, if I was going in there now, of course, I know so much more, which is why sure. there's so much, I think um, it's important to have people that have done this before in your administration to help guide you and walk you through you know, how this really works. And the first year is always tough in any job. Imagine a job in under the circumstances that I just described where every movement you make is like re-evaluated and tested and shown and, you know, over and over again. And it's just, it is, it's something. Did you have secret service? No, I didn't have secret service. I would be, I wonder, I mean, so you know, one thing I hadn't really thought about, except it just dawned on me is just how high profile you and your husband are. And especially in a role like that, all of a sudden, you do have to start thinking about, you know, who's how you're posting stuff on Facebook and right. Yeah. You have to be a little thoughtful. Yes. No, it, oh, no, it's no, no social media. I had no No, social media. That's all they had to be shut down. And, um, you know, it is a little creepy. People would go through your garbage or people would follow you in the, in the, um, the grocery store. So my time outside of my apartment and the White House were extremely limited. I bet. Extremely then, limited because it just wasn't worth it. It was just too difficult. Right. And then there's the conversation with Victoria that says, hey, you need to be thoughtful, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can't just be out all night dancing tabletops although she doesn't strike me as someone who would be out all night doing that anyway, but you do have, she might be out all night, but not on a tabletop. (laughs) Doubtful. She's a, that's me. I know that's me too. That's me too. (laughs) That would be me. She'd be pulling us off. Yeah. She'd be like, mom, what are you doing? Sit down. (laughs) Really? Come on. Embarrassing. Stop it. (laughs) Oh my God. I know. No, no, no. So I, you know, that was a, it was an amazing, amazing experience to see. And it kind of puts a lot of stuff in perspective. After you do that, it puts a lot of stuff in perspective. And, you know, I'm a cancer survivor. So I would say when I was there, if something would happen, I was like, you can't scare me. I've survived cancer. Now I say, you can't scare me. I survived cancer and the White House. (laughs) Right. I've seen a lot of stuff. Yeah. Desiree, we skipped that too. Yeah. What, at what, in what part of your career did you find out you had breast cancer? Hmm. Let's see, where was I? It had to be, it was in 2000. So where was I? I can't even remember where I was. It was before the White House for sure. I think yeah, it, it was. Oh, I know where it was. I'm sorry. How could I forget this? It was at um, the energy company. Okay. Yes. And so did you take time off? You know what? I took uh, time off for all my treatments my staff, they were amazing to me. And so they would drop off work at my home. I'd work from, from home. They pick it up. Mm. And I had, a, a, you know, conversations with my senior team, you know, directional conversations when I could, when I felt well. Mm. And um, they held it together for me. I got mm. my promotion actually after my bout with cancer. Mm. And so probably I'm going to say within six months after I came back, I was promoted uh, to be president of the company. Wow. I mean, and that's an incredible thing to overcome as well, right? Is just the fear of all of a sudden recognizing that we are mortal, even though sometimes we don't feel like we are. Well, the thing I really learned, you have to take care of yourself and you Mm -hmm. have to listen to your body. And so I know I was very guilty of just taking an Alka-Seltzer cold plus and keep going. Yeah, you know, or taking two Tylenol and keeping going. And that's not a good thing. If you are in a situation where you don't feel well, the best thing to do is take a break. Yeah. You know, the work will still be there the next day. It will. (laughs) It's not going anywhere. And so, you know, this rush to prove that I can do anything, I can get it done. I don't do that anymore. Right. Because everyone needs a heavy duty. I think the pandemic has shown us this. You need a really good immune system. Yeah. That's your natural armor. Yeah. And so don't screw around with it. Yeah. Do not. It's not worth it for anybody, young, old, anybody. 
And so I don't do that anymore. Yeah. I'm like not feeling well today. I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Yeah. And you know, so that is such an important takeaway. I hope, um, our, the folks listening really recognize that, um, you know, one thing I do want to touch on is just how tenacious you are in leaving the white house. You became, and were named as CEO of both Ebony and jet magazine. Is that and right? Fashion fair and fashion fair. So Johnson publishing was the holding company. Right. And so yeah. you had an opportunity to understand what it meant to run a media business I did. And, and really build that uh, up. I'd love to hear from your perspective now and how you became or thought about pivoting to becoming an entrepreneur because Black Opal and Fashion Fair Cosmetics are both incredible legacy brands. They have so much brand equity. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I'd love to hear, was it your time at Ebony and running that publication and understanding what the opportunity for the category was that whet your appetite to then move into buying these businesses and becoming an entrepreneur? Or what was the inspiration? So one of the things we've talked about is this whole concept and I know many people, and I still do it. We say, well, what, my brother always says, what do you bring to the table? Mm. You know, what are you good at? And sometimes we struggle with that. We, and so I think an important exercise is to sit down and really write that down mm. and be really clear with yourself, not embarrassed about it, but this is what I'm good at. And also this is what I'm not so good at. Mm. Both understanding both is so important. Mm -hmm. So when I began to string together my like career, you know, coming out of the White House, I mean, I got beat up at the end. I was like, very much like, oh my God, what am I good at? I thought mm. I was good at this, but am I really? I mean, lots of questions about really what am I bringing to the table? What is my skill set? And trying to be really secure in that. And so that line, that mature business, that line going across, goes across every job that I've been in, whether it is that lottery position the people's energy positions, the all state position in the white house, they're all mature. You know, the white house wasn't born yesterday, nor was yeah. all state or right. people's energy or the lottery. Right. You know? And so I'm pretty good at, at figuring, you know, with the strengths there and then making it into something new and fresh and exciting mm -hmm. uh, for, for today's population. So I figured I could bring some of that into Johnson publishing when I decided to take that job. I would say I probably never would have ended up there and wanting to be in the ethnic space had I not done time at the White House with the president and Mrs. Obama. Mm. They inspired me to look for a role in my community, mm -hmm. you know, to, to look for opportunities that I could be helpful in, particularly in business, in the ethnic space. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. Hmm. And so that's no, number one. And so here I am, I'm like, wow, one of the, you know, the most incredible brands ever built right here in my backyard. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be a consultant and then get the offered the role of CEO for the business. I'd known the family for many, many years. And so one of the things as a business person that was pretty clear is a lack of capital to build all three businesses. I mean, the media business they certainly had, which was so changing so much, as we all know, and has continued to evolve and will continue to evolve. Oprah just launching her, her daily message versus, you know, publishing something every month. So we had all of that going on. We had the makeup business, and they also have an incredible archive of 5 million photographs of African-Americans since 1942. So how do you capitalize on that? And how do you think about that business in a way that's going to make sense for the long term? And ultimately, we wound up selling the media business. So shoring it up so that it was appropriate for sale, creating mm -hmm. a digital footprint, rethinking you know, the editorial. We had a couple of great editors that served during the time that I was there, kind of repackage the message, rethink about the, the work and what Ebony represented. We did experiential, which again, taking mm -hmm. something from a White House experience, how do you bring the pages to life? And we created the Ebony Power 100 event similar to the Time 100 event, except 
person selected through Ebony with entertainment and all. But that's what I modeled it after because I went to the first Time 100 event with Mrs. Obama during my time at the White House. So I was like, ah, oh, we can do this. And so that was a great experience for me. But one of the things I, not but, what I also saw as we were trying to right size that, that business, and again, easy for me, they were like children to the family though. Sure. We don't want to sell one. Oh no. But I spent a lot of time going out in the field and standing behind counters, um, the fashion fair counters. Yeah. And I continue to like get this insight into women of color, women of color who would talk about all kinds of things with the people that were serving them behind the counter, because this is a brand that was started in the seventies. Yeah. So those ladies and gentlemen were their friends. And so there was conversation there. There was an insight into, you know, uh, this whole idea of creating um, confidence, you know, camaraderie, yeah. um, you know, uh, excitement in a new lipstick, yeah. you know, or, or security in knowing that your color was going to be there. Yeah. And fact, it was the first brand to have women of color and men of color behind the counter in the department store where I could try on the cosmetics and not be, and be perfectly matched and not be embarrassed that no color was dark enough for me. Sure. You know, and so you saw this insight, I saw this insight into women of color that I was like, wow, this is powerful. And if I ever have a chance, this is an area that I think I could make, you know, a difference in Mm. not just a, the cosmetics themselves, but beyond that, as the, as the business became more mature. Right. And so that was just in the, in the back of my head. So were you, were you more enamored with the product side of the business at that point and thinking, God, I would love to build this beauty company. Cause you're right. Resource is key. You can't feed all the babies. You have to have so, enough resource so, to do yeah, both. So when I was there, I was really recommending that the other assets be sold off sure. to fund the, the cosmetics business. Interesting. That was my recommendation probably after eight months. Yeah. I and could clearly see that's where it was probably be the best. And didn't they did, they, did they end up selling off the publishing business? We sold that when I was yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. We closed that deal. We did the first piece. Okay. I didn't get through the other two pieces. But yeah. we did that first. We did that first piece, which was, you know, again, like I said, as a business person, it makes total sense. If it is your own family jewels, it's more difficult. Of and I'll course. leave it at that. Oh, no. I've run a family-run company. I know exactly <laughs> I'll the leave it at that. Oh, and I so know. when I left that business, I, um, I just took, a time to, took time to really kind of think about what I wanted to do. But something in the ethnic beauty space mm. was where I was leaning. Mm. And so I was looking for a company in that space that I could be part of the leadership team, uh, purchase, you know, I did, I did 24 months of work on this. I looked at 30 different companies. I actually interviewed with a couple of beauty companies. No one quite knew where to place me though. Right. They're like, huh, but you did power. And this is, a, you know, a lesson of power and insurance and lottery and white house you want to run a beauty company? Right. I'm like, yeah, I do. Yeah. Because I remember, I also did this fashion fair business. Yeah. And, and so people struggled with in big cosmetics companies, what to do with me. Yeah. And I found that fascinating, but I get it a little yeah. bit. No, I don't, but I get it. You know, I get it. But I, I knew that if some pla if places were that concerned about where to place me, they really weren't going to be in an innovative enough for me. Yeah. And keep my interest. Right. And so I just kept looking and I had identified um, Black Opal as a company that we should have bought when I was at Fashion Fair. Mm. And I actually had said to the chairman, you know, this is a company we should buy one day. And so I knew how great and what high quality the products were from Black Opal. Yeah. But I just didn't know where, who was making it. Yeah. You know, and I, I, you know, I just was like, I'm going to figure this out. And I did. I mean, I, it wasn't like I was like going crazy trying to figure it out. But one day I was in the manufacturing plant um, working on eyeshadows for Fashion Fair. And I heard the name in the hallway and I said, what? 
And they were like, oh yeah, we make it. I'm like, what? I said, can I meet the, the I'm here right now. Can I meet the, the, the guy that owns this? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, why not? <laughs> Literally hounded the man at the Christmas party. It was like a Christmas party for vendors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, customers. Yeah. So I went there. I had my cute little dress on. And I said, I am going to find this man and I am going to get this done. He is going to sell And he's looking at me like, who business. is this girl? I'm like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> he's like, aren't you? A j-? I'm like, yes, I, you know, it's like I was, I used to be there, but I'm not, you know, anyway. So that's how I met him. And then when I, I left, we talked about me going to work there. And I said, you know, no, no. And I knew they wouldn't like me anyway. Not so where is to- John in this conversation? Cause he is so, I know he's just like, like, wait, by now I'm well-trained. He's like looking and watching, <laughs> watching and watching. Do you I'm, call him and say, Hey, I'm I well tra- this- trained in the, in the Rogers way. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm well-trained. So I'm like, I'm just, pursu- I'm just like, just pursuing. I'm just trying to get it done. And, you know, after two and a half, two plus years, I, you know, I pursued, I had another friend who's an entrepreneur. He said, you just got to keep calling them every month. Just keep calling every month. And every time I was in New York, I'd have dinner with he and his partner and we'd laugh and I'd be like, what about that company? No. And then one day, I mean, it's kind of bittersweet, but one day, one of those dinners, the, he didn't, the owner wasn't there. And the partner said, he passed. He would like to show it. He would like you to buy it. And he, he's, and he, no one said anything about his health, but the waitress did. Uh-huh. Oh, we're all playing, pay, praying for Mr. Marcos. And I was like, what? And wow. it just so happened that he was ill. And so he decided before he died that he wanted me to have it. I have goose skin. I know. Isn't that like, so like, so that's part of my drive every day too. We are never, ever not going to have him be very proud of us from looking from wherever he is. Wow. Ever, Desiree. Not ever. We are working every day for that Mr. You know, Nico. Nick yeah, yes. Nico. We're working every day for him. You yeah, know, the, he's magical. Because he was like, you know, he created this, he and his wife and an African-American dermatologist. And so we're staying in that, that same vein of cre- keeping the quality. You know, we have a dermatologist that works with us. We want, you know, we want him to be proud and we want to be proud. And he saw fit to sell the company to Cheryl McKissick and I. And here we are almost two years later in June of, you know, making the magic happen. That's right. So how do you wake up every day? Do you love being an entrepreneur or do you wake up every day saying, man, this is hard. Why do people do this? (laughs) (laughs) This is what the first thing, everything is hard. (laughs) So I, you know, it's easy for you to say this is easier than that, but I really feel like everything is hard. And I feel like everyone is working hard today on everything they're working on. There's no easy work. That's why they call it work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the the, the question is like, what are you good at and what do you enjoy doing? And can I start to have more time in those, in those areas that I'm really good at? Mm-hmm. as opposed to working on things that I'm not as good at. And it's going to take me much longer to do it than somebody else. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's important to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Now, some days you don't have the luxury of being able to assign that to someone else. And that's where the warrior comes in because you still got to get it done. And so you got to grit your teeth and get through it and hope is as right as it can be, but you can't just think it's going to go away because it's not. And so- that's right. I wake up encouraged. I wake, I, I learn something new every day. I am so much looking forward to building our team. Uh, I'm so much looking forward to surprising and exciting our consumers with all the new newness we have, have coming into the marketplace right now. We've got 1,300 new distribution retail sites opening in July in both CVS and Ulta. Congrats. And so I'm thrilled about that. And I'm thrilled about, you know, our employees and our partners that have worked with us almost two years now, just seeing what, how all their work is coming, coming to light and those accolades that they all deserve because everyone has done, you know, a piece of this work to bring these high quality brands, you know, to people at under $20. So I'm just, you know, I'm just, we're just working. 
Yeah. We're enjoying it. We're getting, you know, some good feedback on, on what we've done. But, you know, it's a learning. We're learning too. You know, we're where learning. is Fashion Fair sold right now? It has not uh, launched yet. So you're going to relaunch it? It's launching in September. Ooh. And is it more of a premium price yes, brand? Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you foresee it in direct to consumer plus yes. retail? Yeah. And are you allowed to say what retailer we can no, find it in? Okay. Not yet. <laughs> but we can search for it in September yes, of 21. Yes, we'll be able to. Well, I, we will be announcing in August. I'm sure you have a massive database of fans who are waiting to find out where it'll be available. Oh, we do. We do. <laughs> we do. And we hope to have more fans. I mean, this one is so much more complicated yeah. than the other one. And because of the history, because of its iconic place in culture, American culture, mm -hmm. and honoring that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, where we find ourselves as Americans in this whole, um, you know, I mean, you know, racial divide, whatever you want to call it, and all of the mm -hmm. changes in the conversation that are happening at the same point that we're relaunching, you know, an American iconic brand that was in the middle of that discussion back in the 70s is going to launch again in this, you know, 2021, where we're still having some of those same discussions. And I am hopeful that Fashion Fair is a place where black culture, the intersection of black culture, where we provide an open forum to have these salons, to have these discussions about politics, art, culture, literature, film, fashion, and of course, beauty. Yes. I love <laughs> it. I can't wait. I mean, it is an iconic brand. It is a legacy brand. It's like Coca-Cola or Harley Davidson or you know, it's just, it's, it's got, it's rooted right. in, in culture and it's rooted in, um, community and conversation mm -hmm. representation. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a, a heart connection there, much mm -hmm. like going to the barber shop, right, right. For men, right. it's the idea that those fashion fair counters mm -hmm. were almost like a mini coffee shop. Right. Exactly. And you saw me first. Yeah. You saw me first. Yeah. You know, you didn't try to change me. You saw me, you created for me. Yeah. You it's know, and so deal. it's a really exciting. I spend many, many hours thinking about this every day when I'm sleeping, when I'm up, when it's all in my, my mind and it is very emotional to bring it out stage by stage. And so I have to kind of pace myself. Yeah. And, and, you know, I take a little mental time to pace myself because it's very heady territory yeah, that bet. I'm in, that I'm treading on, that I am trying to ensure that we put the absolute best foot forward. And we literally started from, we had nothing. We started yeah. from, from scratch because it's been out of the market for over two years now. Wow. I can't wait to watch your growth. So we're really, and, really happy, but also nervous and scared. Of course, <laughs> of course, because you have to protect the legacy uh, and the inherent inherent connectivity that your customer has had for decades and decades before you bought the company. So mm -hmm. there's this fine balance between refreshing a brand right. and bringing the, the ethos of it back Back through right. That and refresh. you know, people are going to remember what they remember. And especially since it's been off the market, but well, it used to be like this. Oh, of course. You know? And then there's a comparison between what it used to be and what this is. Is it still the perfect chocolate raspberry color? Yeah. You know, is it the perfect one? You know, and the amount of time and energy going into matching, but still ensuring that the very best quality products and ingredients are used to do what they should be doing on your lips. It's incredible. You know what I mean? So it's well, like, I want to go to your fashion fair party whenever you decide to have your launch all right, party. Girl, all right, I, girl. I can't wait. I hope we're back and having something by then. Oh, we are. We are. If it's the last thing we all do. I hope we are. I think moving. fall is going to possibly be good. Oh, I think it's going to be great. I'm hoping. I'm hoping it's going to be good. So in, in closing, Desiree, if you could 
um, share anything with your younger self or for those listening who are thinking about jumping into being entrepreneurs or kind of taking it by day by day and not sure they can do it? Do you have any words of wisdom or, you know, practices that, that serve you, whether it be a working out every day or meditation or things that just, you say, you know, stop and smell the roses, yeah. anything that's important to share? Yeah, I, I think for me, the most important thing I would share is do what you need to do. You know, some people go, oh, I do yoga or I do Pilates. I do, you know what? Maybe I do those things, but that's not what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, the, the time best spent as a young person is, is, is fe feeling your way and figuring out what are those things that you give you your happy moments mm -hmm. that inspire you to be able to do the work that you need to do. When I say happy, your own personal, like, thrill. It could be something as easy as chai tea. I don't know. A Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. It could be whatever it needs. A conversation with your mom for two minutes or your sister or your boyfriend or your partner, or your husband, whatever that is, tickling your baby. Mm. But don't be afraid to do whatever that is. Don't let anyone hold you from that because that's your fuel. Yeah. That's what allows you to be you. Yeah. And that is what allows you to be the best you. Yes. So there's no, you know, perfect, like you need to do A, B, C, D, E, and then you're going to be successful. Right. It doesn't work like there's some basics, you know, always, you know, try to be curious, try to, you know, make certain that you're focused on, on, on something you can do, you know, people yeah. look at, well, I see her and she does this really well. I want to do that. No, 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 no. What do you do well? So that's a big piece of this is, and that's a journey. It takes a while, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what are you passionate about? And, but you need to be good at it too. That's right. You know, you need kind of both and it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be a hundred percent. It's not going to, you're not going to jump up and be bingo, but you're going to be like, you know, I'm pretty good at this and I kind of like it. That's yeah. it. That's your thing. That's it. <laughs> That's what you're looking for. Grab that, it. Grab that. And then that's when you go after it. You're like, who do I know that could be helpful to me in that? You know, what can I read? What can I look up? Who can I talk to? Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to be aggressive about your practice. It's your practice. Yeah. That is your practice. And you're also going to forgive yourself when you make mistakes. And you're also going to make certain that as you practice your practice, that you're going to get what you need to be able to practice your practice. Mm. And no one else can tell you what that blueprint is, mm -hmm. but lots of people can help you. I'm sorry. I call it now my black print, my BLK print Ooh. that no people can't, they can help you with it, but they can't build it for you. Yeah. You have to have your own BLK print. Yeah. You have to. That's right. You know, it's the only way it makes you be who you are and you have to embrace it. And as you get older and older, you embrace it more and more, or some people don't. And that's where we get into trouble and right. surround yourself with people that will embrace your practice and what it is that you're attempting to do. And it doesn't always have to be this big ladder of success or powerhouse or all these words, be your own powerhouse. That's right. You know, own your power. Yeah. We all have power. That's right. You know, and, and sometimes, you know, things, people are like, oh, it's all about like, just my power is rewarded because I made X amount of dollars or this many people. No, it's not. Right. No, actually, it's really not. The power is your own internal being and your own internal grounding and happiness. I will always pick the happiness tea, even though my mother's like, that's not the tea you're supposed to be picking. Yeah. You're supposed to be picking health tea. I'm like, mom, I'm picking the happiness tea. Because if I'm happy, I'm sure I'm healthy. I'm with you 110%. <laughs> you know, I'm sure I'm probably healthy. Yeah. So I like the happiness tea. I'm going to stick I'm with, with you. that one. I'll take, I'll take two of those. <laughs> <laughs> Desiree, it's such a privilege. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing your heart, your, your health, your happiness, your path. You've had such an incredible career. You've left such a legacy just in your own self, but such a legacy with your daughter in the woman that she's becoming and is. And so I really honor that. Thank you. Yeah, for we your... don't know which team Miss Victoria would take. I'm going to ask her though. Ooh. She'll be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, all I the T's with the names on them. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you see that? China. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I can't. What wait. are you we talking to, about, Mom? We, yeah, I bet I think, I, I'm going to bet that's the answer. I'll let you know. <laughs> I think it would be so interesting to have all three of you back because yes. what a powerhouse family you are. <laughs> Uh, well, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you for tuning in to From Potential to Powerhouse, Success Secrets from Female Leaders with your host, Tracy Holland.